name is Kamal Abu Shamsia. I'm the director of the Interreligious Chaplaincy Program at the Graduate Theological Union. I earned a doctorate in practical theology and I address the intersection between ethics and law in end of life care. Here at the GTU, we train people of diverse faith communities to serve as chaplains in different settings. We work with them on reflections on universal values and tools to prepare them to be chaplains, such as empathy, listening, service, conducting spiritual assessment, and where do they apply that in the different settings where chaplains serve, such as in healthcare, in the military with all its branches, in the prison system, in colleges, corporations. So whatever their people are, there will be need for spiritual care. And we prepare our students to take care of their clients in the different settings. There were many moments that I connected at a deeper level with myself and with the people I serve. The yearning for connection and for experiences is universal. Yet sometimes we don't know how to get there. It starts with how you greet people, the smiling. It's the sitting at an eye level, or sometimes for me, kneeling on the floor so I can be an eye level with the bed. Making myself available, the use of myself. What I mean by that is I lend a hand. I lend a shoulder for people to cry on. The simple thing of act of holding one's hand. You feel the pulse of that patient. You warm their hands and they warm yours as well. Sometimes we crack a joke. This is something what they miss in life. One of the questions I ask, if you are not in the hospital, what would you be doing? So they start to tell me about their life experiences on a daily basis, whether it be it walking a dog that brings them joy and happiness, whether it be it gardening that gives them a purpose, renewal, whether it be it cooking a meal. It is what we see, what we smell, what we touch and not just with our hands and with our eyes. It is with our heart, how you connect with others. Crying with my patients have been very, very fulfilling. It's not a purpose, yet it comes and we don't stop when the tears are coming. It's a form of connecting, feeling, humanizing ourselves and a response to another heart that is in pain, another soul that is in pain. Comforting a mother whose her child is about to die for a delivery that went unexpectedly wrong, or being with the family as they say goodbye to their loved one, the patriarch of their family. And you walk in and you see people who are on their cell phones, people sometimes who are stunned, unexpected death or weeping or in shock, and you bring all those hearts together. And you start to ask, tell me about their lives. How would you like to remember them? Or how would they like you to remember them? So you help people. It's about service, guiding at times of need. It's like the lighthouse at the times of a ship coming into a harbor and there is fog. So it's the brain is already foggy by the experiences. These are ways where the chaplain can be helpful, whether it be reciting the, the favorite poem of the person. How do we know all these things? It starts with a conversation. Right before we get there, we ask the people what's important to you. And what that, when that moment comes, how would you like us to do? Or what would you like us to do? It's not always that we can get the luxury of knowing what people know in advance, but yet we try to read what's in the room. Sometimes entering to a room and seeing postcards being given by grandchildren to their grandparents, we start to ask about their grandchildren and you start to see the joy. It's just a simple way of connecting people with their loved ones. And as we do that, 
we look at our own selves, our own relationships, and our own functioning in life, inspired by the people that we serve and inspire, inspired by our own faith as well. One of the stories I would like to share with you today is about a person who came to me when I was working in a congregation as a chaplain, and he was at the end of his life. It was very difficult for him to talk to his family and how to say goodbye. So I taught him how to connect to his family, not just with words, it's beyond words. How to live the last six months of his life living while dying. And when things become so difficult and can't find the courage to talk to the family, I asked him to write a letter for them. But there was also another immediate need that he shared. He could not take his family to select a place of burial for himself. So he came to my office one day that was sunny and we decided to take a walk. I drove him to the local cemetery, held his hand, and together we took a walk between graves until we got to a location where he stopped and he said, this will be a good spot for me. My family can come and park in this particular area, sit under the shade of this tree. And that's exactly what we did. He purchased the plot. When he died, I fulfilled his wishes of preparing him, of giving him the ritual bath, presiding over the funeral prayer, the memorial service, burying him in the spot that he asked for. And most important than that, the family was so appreciative. The surviving family members who said he relieved us of a pain that we did not know how to talk to him about. He found confidence in you to share with you what he was unable to share with us. So instead of me being in their lives at a time that is very difficult, it became an appreciative moment of the service of the chaplain. It has been over 15 years since this incident happened yet the relationship with the family continues to this day. Through interactions between the chaplain and the people they serve, we look at needs for our patients, our inmates, our service members, their families, the people we work with, and those can be for others and for the self as well. We look at the need for healing, and it can be physical, it can be theological, ethical. We look at ways of deepening our own awareness of what's going on around us. What can we learn? What's the impact of this illness that we're having on us, on the people around us? And how does it impact our relationship with God? To achieve that, we enter into an intentional conversation and relationship. It's not a social visit when we ask a person about their own lives. It is a deeply theological, spiritual relationship that we seek. Mm -hmm.